pre-processing is the things we do to our data before we start to build our machine learning models. It might sound like a kind of small thing, but it's super important. Because if you mess up the way that you load in your data or the way that you represent your data, then no fancy machine learning model is going to save you from those type of mistakes. In practice, it's also one of the things that data scientists and machine learning engineers spend most of their day-to-day -day time on, probably a lot more than developing some fancy new machine learning algorithm. So it's really important that you get the steps that we'll discuss in the next few videos. What we're going to look at in this video specifically is feature normalization and scaling. Basically, how we move, um, squash, and stretch our data um, so that we represent them in a way that's useful for our machine learning models and optimization algorithms. Many optimization algorithms can run into problems when the scales of the features are very different. There are some algorithms that can be ro more robust to scale issues. But very often it turns out that when you're optimizing a model and the scales of your features are very different, then that turns out to be problematic. Standard gradient descent is one of these cases. So let's just look at an example on this breast cancer data set. You can find the data set at this link. Um, this is a data set where we're trying to classify whether a patient has breast cancer or not based on a number of features. Here we're just looking at two features, the mean um, cell nucleus radius for a malignant and non-malignant cells, and then the mean cell nucleus smoothness for malignant and non-malignant uh, cells. And what we see here is that the mean radius, if you look at the, this feature, you can think of that as X1, the scale here is very, very different from the mean cell smoothness um, feature. Here we go from 5 to 30 um, in some units and here we go from 0 0.04 to 0 0.16. So here what we're going to do is we're going to fit a linear logistic regression classifier to this data set using standard gradient descent and just intuitively we're going to look at what happens and at what scale the update for gradient descent is in this case. So here, because it's a linear logistic regression classifier that we're training, we've got three terms, the bias term, then the weight of the first feature, and then the weight of the second feature. And here, what I've shown is just little snapshots of the gradients for a thousand iterations, 2000 iterations, and so on. And what you see here is if you look at the size of the updates to the different parameters, you've got numbers like uh, around 300 here, um, a few thousand here and then tens here. And what you can see is because the features are at such a different scale, these the sizes of the gradients are quite different for the different parameters. Now, why is this problematic? I don't want to go into you know the fine-grained details here, but just intuitively, let's think about gradient descent, for example. In gradient descent, we've got one um, parameter, the learning rate, eta, and we, in standard gradient descent, apply a single eta to all the different parameters. And this can be quite problematic if some of your parameters are changing in the orders of, you know, a few thousand, while some of the other parameters are changing with like tens. So I trained this logistic regression model, this particular one for a few thousand iterations. And then let's look at the prediction. It looks something like this. It's not ridiculous. Um, it seems it seems reasonable that a point here would be classified as non-malignant, um, but maybe we can do a little bit better. So one solution to this problem of scale is to rescale the features so that the scales for the different features are similar. So what we're going to do is for each of our inputs, uh, for each of our n um, little n training inputs, we're going to take the d feature dimension and we're going to subtract the sample mean from that dimension and then we're going to divide by the sample standard deviation. Um, so there's a little mistake here, this should be that squared is the sample variance of the DEEF feature. And if we do that, then for each of the dimensions we will have over our data set, we will have a mean that's approximately zero if we basically replace our original training data set with this x tilde, 
then we will have a mean that's approximately zero and a variance that's approximately one for each of the feature dimensions. So let's just quickly see how we calculate these values. So let's say this is our uh, training data set, consists of capital N points. This is the value of the first dimension for the first training item, the second dimension for the first training item, and so on. So in the breast cancer um, example, this would be the mean radius, and this would be the mean smoothness for um, different cells. And what we would do is we would first calculate the sample mean for the first dimension. And that will involve, um, so here we've got the equation, that will involve adding up 11, 25, 17, and so on, up to 6, and then dividing that by the number of points. And that gives us the sample mean. And the sample variance, same similar thing. What we would do is we would take 11 and then we would subtract the sample mean and square that. And then we would take 25, subtract the sample mean, square that, 17, so on. And then we would add all of those numbers up and then divide by n minus 1. And that gives us the sample variance for the first dimension. And then what we would do is um, instead of using 11 as this value here, what we will do is we will replace 11 with the value here, and that value will be 11 minus the sample mean for the first dimension divided by the sample standard deviation for the first dimension. That's how you get that value. For the second dimension, same thing. So we take the values here in the second dimension, we add them all up, divide by the number of points, that gives us the sample mean, similar steps for the sample standard deviation, and then similar for this value here, we take 0 0.1, we subtract the sample um, mean for the second dimension now, and divide that by the sample standard deviation for the second dimension, and that's how we get that value, and so on. So we basically replace our original features like these with these normalized um, feature vectors. I use this tilde notation here. That's not entirely standard. It's not something you'd see in many other textbooks. So sometimes what happens is in a paper or a textbook, uh, the authors might just say we mean and variance normalize our data. And then they would actually still just use, um, you know, the standard X to represent that normalized data. So here, this is the same breast cancer data set, but here we've normalized the two features so that they have means that's close to zero. You can see that there. So mean over the whole data set, irrespective of the classes, that's quite important. So you normalize without looking at the Ys. Um, the mean of this thing is close to zero, and the standard deviation across the two dimensions is uh, approximately one. Now let's do logistic regression, again using a linear logistic regression, and we train that with gradient descent. So similar to a few slides ago, what I've done here is I've just written out the, the gradient updates for our three parameters. And what you can see here is that the scales are much closer together. They're within you know, a factor of 10 from um, one another. And if we look at the um, prediction, the decision boundary from logistic regression on this normalized data, we see this very nice fit to the data. Let's just quickly compare that to the previous prediction by just jumping back. So this is logistic regression on the original data. And we can see that our decision boundary, just intuitively, I mean, we need to um, you know, go through the process of validating the model to make concrete claims, but just intuitively looking at these decision boundaries, we see a much nicer fit using the normalized data. So one thing I should already say at this point is when we get a new test input point, right? Let's say we get a point here. Then the question is, how do you normalize that test input point to match what you did during training? And you should think about this carefully because often what people do is they normalize all their data together, training, validation, and testing. But that's actually not what's going to happen at test time uh, in a typical setting. In a typical setting, you're going to get this test point here, and you won't be able to calculate the sample means and sample variances for that point. There are cases where that could happen. For example, if you get a very large test set all in one go, then of course you can calculate the sample mean and the sample variances, but that's not always the case. 
So one thing that I often do is I store the sample mean and the sample variances for my training data, for this training data. And then I would take this one input feature vector, the new um, feature vector that I haven't seen before, and I will apply the normalization step using the means and the variances from my training data to basically map this, this point here to the corresponding point in the normalized space. Um, maybe it lands somewhere here, but you use the samples, um, sample means and variances from your training data to estimate that. Here we're looking at two other features in the breast cancer data set. So here we've got the standard error of the radius and the standard error of the texture. And I want to use this example to um, basically show something else about features. So we've looked at feature normalization, but we can also scale features in different ways. So some classifiers, for example, if you're going to use Gaussian naive Bayes, they make some assumptions about how the data is generated or how the data lies in the feature space. So for Gaussian naive Bayes, the basic assumption is that you've got these kind of Gaussian blobs over the different classes. And clearly, depending on how your data is represented, that might or might not be true. And you can do things in pre-processing to better match those assumptions. So just as an intuitive idea of, of how that would work, in this case, for example, it's very clear that our features, the original input features, um, basically are all positive values. And here we've got positive values as well. And what you might want to do is, depending on how the data is spread, and we'll see how that pans out in this, uh, in this example, you might want to take the log of these um, different features. And instead of using the original features, you use the log values. So let's take the log on both um, x1 and x2 and represent the, um, this data set in that way. So what we see here is if we take the logs, then the data is spread out in a much more sensible way in terms of like little blobs that you might want to fit here and here for Gaussian naive Bayes. Even for logistic regression, it might be easier to fit a decision boundary in this space um, than to fit a decision boundary in that space. Now, I know that's a little bit of a fluffy um, explanation. I'm basically just showing you examples. Um, and that actually highlights something about um, pre-processing in general. So very often feature normalization and scaling is quite messy and it is a bit of an art. But you can develop an intuition as you play around with different models and optimization algorithms on different problems for how you should normalize and scale. You can also think of normalization and scaling as something that you do during development. You try a few different normalization and scaling approaches and see how performance differs on a validation set. But then it is super important to always think about how you will apply your model to new unseen data. If you're going to classify things on a point by point basis, basically getting a test point and um, you have to classify that test point on its own, then you won't have multiple points to um, calculate a sample mean and a sample variance. So in that case, if you're just getting a single point and you're asked to classify that, you're going to have to use your training sets, um, sample mean and sample variance to normalize that point. In other cases, you might get a humongous test set in one go, and that whole test set, you want to classify everything in that test set in one go. And then it might actually be possible to calculate sample means and sample variances from the test data itself. So it's important during training and during model development to think how you're going to apply your model in the real world.